So this last section on setting up formulas. So this is, uh, I mean, you've been setting up formulas pretty much throughout school. You, you've seen, uh, like, for example, surface area and volumes. You've inherently calculated or, or created formulas for situations where you might not have ex not really thought of it as a formula. Like anything that you go and buy, for example, let's say you go buy something in quantity. Let's say that you go, um, um, I went grocery shopping yesterday. I bought two, two loaves of bread and a block of cheese. That, I can make a formula out of that uh, in terms of the money that I spent. I could say that it's two, uh, two B, where B is the, the value of what one loaf of bread is, and then one C, where C is the cost of buying the, the cheese. So like you can literally just make up formulas for anything. And, th and that's what the exercise is here. So this is not something that, this is not a topic that I can say like, okay, do these 10 examples and this will represent everything you'll ever see in your life. That's not what this is meant to be. This is meant to be like practice creating the formula, get used to it. Don't be scared of all the variables. And the cool thing is, is I'm not asking you to do anything with the formula. I'm just asking you to make the formula. So the author of the book here does a very good job of walking you through some really easy ones, like finding the area of this figure here. So like you would do the area of the big rectangle and then you would subtract the area of the little rectangle. So you could probably just, most of you would probably be able to just look at this and say what the formula would be. It'd be PQ minus RS because PQ is the area of the rectangle and then RS is the area of the little rectangle. So PQ minus RS, let's take a look. See that PQ minus RS. Like, I'm not saying that if you didn't do that in your head that you're gonna fail or something. I don't mean to like that. I'm just saying that there are people here that probably could have done that in their head. And if you didn't do it in your head, I'm sure you could write some stuff down. So that's the kind of thing we're going to be playing with today. I won't be doing questions as easy as that rectangle. I will do questions a little bit more elaborate. So in terms of the exercises that are recommended, I recommend that you go through these examples. There's, there, are, there are four examples involving rectangles, perimeters, areas, and there's one involving a circle. In the exercises, you can also see there's a whole bunch of them. I'm just going to count them up here. There's uh, 15 of them, one five, 15. So we're not going to do all 15. I want you to try some on your own. I'll leave you some of the easy ones, some of the medium ones, and I'll try to do the tougher ones with you in class mostly, and a couple of easy and medium ones as well. So I've chosen here the ones in blue, three, five, seven, and a few ones later on. So we'll try to get them all done, especially the harder ones. And uh, I don't want you to get too intimidated by this. There will be one of these on your test, and I'm pretty sure that it'll be uh, straightforward. Like it's not gonna be something that I'm gonna try to like destroy people. It's gonna be really straightforward question. That's one thing about, as uh, you've, you've experienced with me in class is that the lesson before your test it, or the lessons that are upcoming before a test, I don't try to like, you know, give you the worst possible thing on the next test. So you do have a week or so before your before your final test. So anyway, let's see what we can do with these. Here's our first example. I'll zoom in nice and extra here. So, see, this one involves money. You when you when you have your uh, paycheck. If you're working by the hour, not by salary, then there are formulas like this that you can use to calculate your pay. So just take a moment to read the question. So the question here is about finding someone's hourly pay, which is H. If it, if it intimidates you to see it with symbols, the units tell you the story here. See dollars per hour? That's the key. You can use that as a guide for how to do the question. We know that hourly pay is H, and it's measured in dollars per hour. 
So you can take that quite literally and say that h is equal to something divided by something. And those somethings are dollars and hours. So on the numerator, we are told that this person is paid w dollars per week. So w goes on the top because that's the dollars. Whether it's a symbol or a known value, you just put whatever would accommodate the formula. On the bottom, this person is assumed to be working always 40 hours every week. So that's a little bit artificial, but you would have 40. And that's the answer. That's, that's the question, uh, what it's asking for. It's not asking you to do something too nasty. It's basically it. If you found this type of question easy, I'm feeling, I mean, you should be feeling good for the rest of them. If you found this question a little bit weird, how it's written, I, I promise you that the question I'll give you on a test, even if the formula is more complicated, I, I promise you that the wording of the question will be very like, uh, you don't have to kind of read it twice kind of a question. You just read it first to end, beginning to end and you'll be able to see it and write down the stuff as you read it. So it'll be very quite literal to read it. Okay, let's do number five. If there's any questions, please interject and you can ask me for clarification. But this is the kind of game we're going to play today. I'm just going to give you the question. I'll wait for 30 seconds or a minute. You try making a formula and then let's see if you get the formula right. So number five, I'll give you 30 seconds to read it and then we can discuss. Feel free to write your formula in the chat. If you think you know the formula, if you think you've made it the formula correctly, feel free to write the formula in the chat. Joseph. Uh-oh. Joseph. James. I got I think I think Joseph's got it perfect there. I, that's okay. Um Joseph, uh if you're not employed at the moment, I'd like to hire you as my accountant. That was very well done. But Joseph, uh I I will only hire you as my accountant if you can if you can write the Canadian tax code into one formula. If you could do that, then we are going to be homies. If you can't, then we can't do anything. It's a, it's a no show. Uh, by the way, the Canadian tax formula and the, uh, the Canadian tax code and the formula would probably be the most difficult formula I've ever seen in my life. Anyway, yeah, James's for uh, sorry, Joseph's formula is right on there. So you see the cost, the cost is going to be C, and then we have a uh, J electrical parts at a price of three dollars. So that means there's three J plus K electrical parts at five dollars each. So that's the formula. Let me know in the chat. What did you think? Nicely done, Nicholas. Yes. Nicely done. So we uh you know that's the formula. That's it. Let me know in the chat. There's there's a. let me know in the chat, guys. Uh out of uh, out of the ten students here, we got ten students. How huh? how did you feel about that one? How did you feel about that one? Is that okay? It's good. Does it make sense now, though? Sheldon. Sheldon is quality control today. Sheldon's telling us the it's light work. I like that. Yeah, I'm glad that it's better. Let's keep on going. Okay, we'll keep on trucking through these ones. By the way. If you do find the question easy, which I hope you do, go back through the question again and think about the units. So I'm going to write down the same formula, but without symbols of uh, CJK, I'm going to talk about just dollars and hours and parts or whatever the heck it is. So I have dollars on the left. The three represents dollars per part. 
So we can say here dollars per part times part or parts plus dollars per part times parts. You see what I'm saying? You can use units to save you. Now you might be like, but there's different types of parts. So you can say here uh, part, I don't know, <laughs> part A, part B. I don't want to call it J because J is a counter. It's not a, it's not a, a, it doesn't describe what type of part it is. Something like that. So you see that the units are all consistent because these, these things cancel. What you're looking for is consistency with the unit. So these guys cancel, these guys cancel. So you end up with dollars equals dollars plus dollars, which is definitely something that is consistent. Okay. We have someone else here in the trades doing stuff. Let's make a formula for this one. This is number seven. What the heck is happening here? All right. So this person is making, uh, or installing, sorry, uh, M units in October, N in November, P in December, Q in January. So M, P, uh, Q, and N, these are all quantities or number of units that are or installed, except that they want an average number of units per month. When you want to find the average of something, how do you find the average of something? Just think about your, your basics of averages. How do you find the average of something? Yeah, you divide. So whenever you want an average, you take the total, you take the sum of whatever you're averaging and divide it by the, uh, the number of items. Okay, something like that. This goes with like, I mean, this is just doing a simple, I'm talking about a simple average here, okay? This is a very simple average. You could have more complicated averages, something called a weighted average. But in this case, we just want a simple average. So if we want to know the number of units per month, so A is the average number of units per month. It would make sense that A equals the total number of units over the number of months. I'll spell that better in a second. Now that's not my formula there. That's just me experimenting with the words. You know, like when you write, when you're writing an essay, you don't write an essay perfectly right off the bat. You just put words on the page and you kind of brainstorm. That's what I'm doing here. I'm just brainstorming things that help me understand the question. Oh, Nicholas. Dangerous, my friend. You're very dangerous today. It's good. I like living dangerously with you in mathematics land. M, E, Q. Well, let's do them in order anyway. M, P, M, N, P. I should learn the alphabet. I'm talking about essays. Anyway, there you go. I'll tell you a true story about university uh, when I was an undergrad talking about the alphabet. So uh, as you're copying this one down, I'll just tell you the story quick. It's, it's pretty funny. I think it's funny anyway. So I, I did engineering uh, physics uh, undergrad. And the first day of school in math class, the professor puts, gives everybody a sheet with the Greek alphabet and says, you have, to have, you have to know the Greek alphabet, how to write it, uppercase, lowercase, uh, by the end of the, the semester, because you'll need it all over the place. So uh, some of you might know that I'm fluent in Greek, because my, uh, my parents are, uh, emigrated to Canada from Greece many years ago. So anyway. I speak Greek fluently, pretty much qualified to teach it. So anyway, I looked at the sheet and the guy beside me had no clue that I knew how to speak and write Greek perfectly. Uh, so I just pretended that I just learned it on the spot and they go, hey, quiz me. And then the guy quizzed me and I started giving all the letters correctly. 
poor guy looked like he started sweating. You look at the movies and someone's sweating out of nervousness. I made the guy sweat. And I go, this stuff's easy. And then he was so panicked because he thought that, oh, my God, this guy is like, is this the competition? And then I turned to him and I go, don't worry. Uh, I, I actually speak Greek already. And then I, me and him became uh, good friends all the way through university after. It was pretty funny. That's my story. So hopefully you enjoyed that story. If you didn't, you can fill in a, you can fill a form at the end of the semester. Oh, my God, Sheldon. So Sheldon's asking if I can give him 5% because he speaks Greek or because if he can speak Greek. Uh, you're dangerous. You would have got me there. You would have got me there. But one thing that you didn't do correctly was you didn't capitalize the, the last letter, the first letter and the last word. Because it, it, the last word is Greek and you have to capitalize the letter E, epsilon. You're dangerous, my friend, Sheldon. Sheldon, I'm telling you, you're dangerous, my friend. Oh, you did. Nice. Nice. Okay, well, your your first lesson in Greek is that there's nicely done. You know that uh, at, at one point, I remember reading somewhere that at one point, when the United States formed, when they, when they, uh, were writing their constitution and doing all that stuff. They, they actually wanted to make Greek an official language there. Really, Nicholas? Damn. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. That's fantastic. When we're back to normal on campus, I want to have a conversation with you in Greek. Nothing crazy. Just, uh, just a break, a, a nice breaker. Really? Um, the, the, the interesting thing is, is that we're talking about formulas here. We're talking about formulas here. And uh, there, that's one thing about that, the Greek language is that it really is a very uh, mathematical language. It really is a very mathematical language. Anyway, we shouldn't get off topic, but that's awesome. Okay, let, let's do this question because I, I, I feel uh, I'm, I'm doing a... So you should be the one teaching the Greek. Damn. Okay, let's get back to this question because now, now I feel like uh, there's there's a bunch of people that are like, uh, John, we need formulas. Let's go. So anyway, here's a box, and the dimensions are length, width, height, as shown here. And the question is to find the total surface area of the box. Okay, so... You may know the surface area formula here. So if you do know the formula for surface area of a box, you could totally just recite it. If you don't remember the formula, we could create it together, which is what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to pretend that you don't know the formula so we can develop it together. So we'll talk about the box in slices. We'll talk about it in faces if you want. The front, the back, the left, the right, the top, and the bottom. And we're going to just write expressions for those things. So the front of the box, what is the area of the front of the box in terms of the letters shown there? W, L, H. What is the area of just the front? Just the front. So we're talking about this. Can someone type it in the chat? What's, the, what's this area here? That's the front. Yeah, WH. What's the area of the back? Well, it's the same thing. That's ridiculous. Okay. What about left and right? So by left and right, I'm talking about this. So I'll just color the box like that. So what's the area of this shape there, that rectangle? What would be the area? Yep. Cosimo, thank you as well. And time for the top and the bottom. I'm not running out of colors here, so I'll use red. 
So what's the area of that? Yep. So LW. So there you have it. Just add those up. The interesting thing with surface area is that you don't really need a formula. You can just uh, you can just kind of tally them up. But anyway, in this case, you can have two WH plus two HL plus two LH. The the neat thing with surface area is that you don't have to explicitly write a formula. You just have to remember that when you're computing the surface area, you always use two letters at a time. See, LH, HW, and WL. Just do two at a time. I'll show you like, in terms of, uh, if, if you're actually doing an application question, I don't even use the letters at all. So this is kind of getting a little bit off of the formulas now. I'm trying to sell you into formulas, trying to get you to convince you to use formulas. But let's say that you had this box here, five, six, and nine, okay? So if I wanted to find the surface area of that and forget about the units, just forget about the units for a second. This is the kind of situation where I don't use a formula. The way that I would calculate it is as follows. And the way that you should calculate it is this way as well. First thing is, Notice that they're all multiplied by two. See the two there, two, two, two? I'm gonna take the two out, and then what I'm gonna do is, just think about what are the different pairs or combinations, if you like, of five, six, and nine. I could have five and six, I could have five and nine, and I can have six and nine. You see, I don't, I just do all the different combinations of the three numbers, five, six, and nine, in terms of pairs of two. So this type of question for surface area, I know this is a little bit off topic of formulas, but you can see that you don't, you can really process the same way. And if you're, and this also helps you possibly if you do have a tough time creating a formula, find the answer with numbers and then generalize to a formula. So that's something else that you can do if that makes you feel comfortable. Back to this formula, you can factor out a two, so that the formula is a little bit more uh, efficient. This second version of the formula, mathematically, is more efficient because it requires less operations. In the first formula, you have to multiply twice, twice, and twice. So you have to do eight multiplications and two additions. In the second formula, you only have to multiply four times and do two additions. So you can see there's only four multiplications. There's one here one here, one here, and when you're done all the bracket, then you have to double it. So there's half as many multiplications. So for that reason, it's more efficient. Sorry, there were six multiplications on the first formula, not, not eight. Eight operations in total. Let's finish this here just because I feel like I, it would make sense to finish that. Anybody have an answer on this one here at the bottom, just for the sake of completeness? What is that? 108, 138, 272. Can someone confirm? 272? Can someone confirm 272? Thank you. Thanks, Cosmo. I didn't give units in the question. I'll just write down units squared. If you're like, what are the units? I don't know what the units are. Just put whatever units you feel like. In other words, just put units in the diagram. We should move on now to do these last two questions. 276, yeah, that's right, actually, yeah. You're right, two times three is six. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. I just read that wrong. I think I said 272 afterwards, so that's silly of me. Okay, anyway. Here's a, here's a fun question, number 14. Just do a couple more of these. And then after that, I think, uh, I think we'll definitely uh, leave it open for people that have questions. So the question here is talking about the formula for the area. 
I don't care about the approximate formula. See where it says approximate formula? Don't worry about that one. Let's just find the exact formula. Okay, I'm not gonna do the I'm not gonna do approximate stuff. You can look up the approximate answer. I'll talk about it after we've done the question because it's actually quite easy. So I mean the approximate part's easy. So anyway, how would you find the area of the uh, the shape in here? This this shape that looks very uh, interesting for let's say an architecture uh, diagram. So this footprint consists of a rectangle and two semicircles. So if you know the formula for the area of a semicircle and two rectangles, you should be good here. However, we're going to be smarter than that. We're going to do this better. For the area, it's a rectangle plus two semicircles. Agreed? So what are two semicircles equal to? A single circle. So there you go. If you know the area of a rectangle and the area of a circle, this question is toast. The area is equal to length times width. What's the area of a circle? What's the area of a circle, guys? This one you got to know for your test. I'm not going to tell you the area of a circle if you if there is a circle or not. That's right. Thank you, Marco. Pi r squared. Nicely done. I think some of you are probably like, how do I type pi in the chat? So anyway, that's the answer to the question. I should use uppercase r so that it matches the diagram. But that's the area that they want. They were talking about an approximate formula. So the approximate formula I'm not so keen on. But it would be uh, pi is 3.14. So I don't, I don't like the approximate formula. It kind of bothers me anyway. Okay, so that's part A. What about the perimeter? The perimeter is a little bit messed up. <clears throat> any any thoughts about the perimeter formula? Yeah, it's the rectangle plus the circle. I can start with that, sure. It's the rectangle plus the circle. But we have to subtract something. Can you think about what we, what we would have to deduct? I'll get my highlighter out here. We have to subtract a little bit. This part. I'll do it in green. See there? We lose this. We lose this, okay? See these empty spaces here? If you're writing down the area of a, the perimeter of a rectangle, yeah, you got to subtract the diameter. Actually, you got to subtract the diameter a couple of times. You got to subtract uh, the diameter uh, times two. You got to take away the diameter times two. Now the diameter is equal to two times the radius, so we'll we'll develop the formula now. I'm gonna do the exact formula only this time. So the uh, perimeter is okay. The rectangle is length plus width plus length plus width. I'll simpl I'll simplify that after. I promise. Just for now, I'm doing it small stuff. What's the perimeter of a circle? It's 2 pi r, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just typing in the side here for people. You can also write it as pi times diameter if you prefer, but 
I'll use the one that uh, Nicholas said in the chat there, and sorry, in the on the mic there. So that's cool. So we'll say here two pi r, and then we have to take away the diameter twice. Taking away the diameter twice is like taking away the radius four times. Okay, so now time to simplify. We have 2L and 2W. This stuff here we can throw away. This answer is perfect. That answer is awesome. If you want to simplify it further, you can. But this answer in red is excellent. If you want to go the extra step and show a little bit more uh, clean answer, you can factor a little bit here. You can take out the R as follows. That answer is not fully factored, but it is nicely written in terms of R. So that would be the perimeter formula. And if you want to do an approximate version, you most certainly can. Uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Because all you're doing is replacing pi with a decimal. So 2 pi is 6.28. And you can factor out the 2 there as well. That's true. That's the approximate formula. And even here, you could factor out the two if you prefer to write it like that as well. Thank you for that. Uh, 2.28, uh, Cosimo, I did this. See, 2 pi minus 4? I just did that as a decimal, just on the calculator by hand, because pi is 3.14, roughly. No worries. All good, man. All good. So you have a, you uh, your assignments are obviously due today, but your next assignment is going to be posted on Sunday. I'd like to post the next assignment sooner, but I have to wait till Sunday. The reason is is I don't want to confuse people because they might see two assignments up on Blackboard and not pay attention to the due dates correctly. So I don't want to confuse people, but I do have the next assignment ready. It's not hard. Um, but there is one question where you have to make a formula. And believe me, it's a lot easier than this question. This question is harder than your assignment. So if this question here was giving you a little bit of grief, uh, just feel, feel good that the assignment will be a lot easier than this for the question, okay? All right, so... Uh, Time to um, do a, one more question together. And it's just a one involving a uh, cube. It looks like it has a cube. So let's take a look at this cube. I'll just give you guys 30 seconds on this if you need to copy anything down. Okay, a perfect cube is L by L by L. The first two questions are going to be quick and easy. 
The first two questions involve uh, the volume and the total surface area. I mean, compared to the previous question, this question only involves L. So we could probably go through this a lot faster than the previous question. But then the last part is pretty intense. And uh, I think it's something on, on the much harder side. So as you know, I do teach uh, math in, the, in, other, other dis, in other disciplines and programs within our school. And I teach in the degree program as well. So this is a court, this is a question part C that I would do with the degree students part C. So you're going to get a taste of uh, some trickier math. Anyway, question A is asking for the volume. What's the volume of this thing? How do you find the volume of a rectangular box? And what's the volume of a box? Or a rectangular prism, if you prefer. That's right, Cosmo. It's length times width times height. But what did you notice? I didn't do LWH. What you wrote down was correct, by the way. I didn't write LWH in this case because they're all the same letter. They're all L. So I wrote LLL. But instead of writing LLL, that's ridiculous. But you answered my question correctly, though. I did ask for the box. So in this case, the volume is L cubed. That's the answer for part A. So volume of the cube is that. Now for the surface area. I could go back to the question over here. Remember the one we did over here in uh, question 11? Remember this formula? Two, and then it was like this. It was LW, LH plus uh, WH. You could do that. You could totally do that here. But instead of having them all different letters, they should all be L's. They should all be L's because they're all length. They're all L in terms of the symbol. So if you go with that, you have two times three L. I know L. I know what L L is. It's L squared. I'm just being silly a little bit for now. So okay, there you go. Six L squared. But I, I, you could use that formula to adapt it. Let me show you a better way. Okay. The better way is this way. Each face of the cube. Each face has an area of L squared because it's L by L. There are six faces in total. So the surface area is going to be six L squared. This is probably the more um, appropriate way to do it. This is a bit of a hack, the first way, because you're just kind of adapting uh, a volume formula, uh, sorry, a surface area formula. So I'm going to put that in gray, not because it's wrong, but because it's inefficient. So the way in gray there is somewhat inefficient because you're taking a complex formula and, and kind of adapting it. Nothing wrong with it, but you should be able to answer the question by just talking about it like that. Anyway, that's the volume and the surface area. So that's parts A and B, and hopefully they were not too uh, intimidating or weird. So the only question now, the only question now is, uh, is part C. Express the volume of this cube in terms of the surface area. Okay, so I guess I should use the letter S here because the question says to use the letter S. That should be fair. So somehow we have to write the volume in terms of the surface area. So this question is going to get a little bit weird. I'm going to scroll down because we don't really need the picture. And I'm going to talk about the uh, stuff now. I'm just going to squeeze all that stuff aside. That's the kind of the easier stuff in the question. So again, the question wants the volume equals to something that involves the surface area. So somehow we want the surface area there. For example, is the volume half the surface area? Or I don't know. I, I know what it is. I'm just trying to 
you know, reason it out with you. Anyway, when you get situations like this, this question would be better off if we wrote the formulas beside each other, like this. If we write the formulas beside each other, then we can kind of see where to go with this. The first thing that I would recommend is somehow to connect the equations. Our answer should only involve V and S. So the variable that we do not want to see anymore is L. We don't want to see L. Okay, it doesn't highlight it anyway. We need somehow to get rid of the L. So my suggestion is this. Let's solve for L here. And then we can plug it into the first equation. So if we solve for L here, we get L squared is equal to 6 over S. Sorry, S over 6. I wrote that backwards. I'm having a little bit of issues today with my algebra. This is not good. Let me do that slower. You want to solve for L squared. Let's write this backwards for a second. Like that. We want to get rid of the 6. So we can divide both sides by 6. Then we have L squared is equal to S over 6. How do you get rid of the square? What's the opposite of square? Or what's the inverse of a square? What? Thank you. So the inverse operation is a square root. So you can cross those out. So we end up with uh, L is equal to S over 6. So L is equal to S over, L is equal to the square root of S over 6. Now you can take that information and plug it in here. So we end up with uh, V is equal to the square root of S over 6 cubed. This can be simplified further, but I wouldn't bother. This answer is fine. This answer satisfies the objective. And if you were to go further with it, you would just be playing with exponent laws. So that's how I would leave the question. For those that are interested, though, I will do a little bit of extra writing on the next page. But uh, this is not something... This is not to an extent that I would expect students to write it. It's just a little bit extra fun, okay? So don't worry. What I'm about to write, don't worry about it. For those students that like are kind of getting scared, don't worry about what I'm writing at the moment. But I do want to do it as a courtesy to anybody in the audience here that wants to see how we could do this uh, a little bit nicer. Okay. So the one thing you can do is split up the square root and say that V is equal to the following. Like that. And if you want, you could take this and write it as an approximate equation by taking this number here and turning it into a decimal. The reason I'm showing you this is because the question asks for an approximate equation. So I'm just trying to show you how you would write it approximately. Because you can take this thing here now and turn that into a decimal. I'm just going to do that on, a web, on my other web browser. So excuse me for that. I'll be stepping away from my, my um, chat here with you as I just type that in somewhere else.
So I just went on a separate website and I just did the calculation. You don't need that many decimal places. I'm just showing you that I, I just took it off of another web page. You could use your calculator there. But let's just go with uh, let's go with three significant digits. So that would be this answer here. There's the volume of the uh, cube in terms of its surface area. Just a little something at the end there for those students that are, are curious about what would be the most appropriate approximate form. There you have it. We have the exact formula on the previous page here in purple. We have the uh, approximate formula here, accurate uh, to three significant digits. And uh, that's about it. That's about it, guys. So I, I don't know if you have immediately anything to do at 11 o'clock, but you have me for the next uh, 10 minutes if you have any questions. I'll stop the recording here, and uh, that's about it. So thank you.